Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Arjen Bobtani, who is the founder of Connext. Connext is a bridge project, and uh, we will talk about this in detail in just a bit. But let me tell you about our sponsors today. Um, our first sponsor is Tallyho. Tallyho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it as a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. With Tallyho, you can enter the Metaverse with a Web3 wallet that's fully community-owned and operated, and it's the first wallet that is also a DAO. Tallyho's commitment to community ownership and public goods stretches beyond the wallet. In January, they became the first sponsor of EtherJS, an open-source JavaScript library helping developers connect to Ethereum. And they recently announced a pledge to commit 2.5% of their total token supply to Gitcoin Aqueduct. Head over to tallyho.cash to try Tallyho Community Edition and play around with its features before its upcoming version 1 and DAO launch. Our next sponsor is Chorus 1. Um, securing blockchains and earning rewards need not be energy intensive or complicated. And by staking your assets with Chorus 1, you contribute to network security and earn rewards too. Chorus One has been a pioneer in this space since 2018 and secures billions of dollars in assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're an institution or you want to run your own branded node, you can use Chorus One's white label service as their, um, and their battle-proven infrastructure to participate in proof-of-stake networks in an easy way. Chorus One team also released an exclusive report on the important events and trends from the first quarter of 2022. And you can read it um, now for free on their website um, at chorus.one, um, where you can also start your staking journey. Our final sponsor is Paraswap. Paraswap is a multi-chain DEX aggregator. This means that through Paraswap, you can easily access the liquidity of various different decentralized exchanges. The protocol automatically finds the cheapest liquidity for you, so you can trade knowing that you're getting the best price. Paraswap is also gas-friendly, and uh, that helps keeping your transaction costs slow. Paraswap recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC and Phantom. You can also use Paraswap directly from your Ledger and Ledger Live, and they are becoming a DAO, so if you have PSP tokens, maybe from the airdrop, that is something you can participate in. There's also a vote on the gas refunds program that just uh, passed in the Paraswap DAO, and this will allow Paraswap stakers to get um, up to a 100% gas refund on their trades on top of their auto compounding yield. So visit, visit Paraswap to learn more at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Arjun, it's uh, so good to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. Arjun, um, tell us about yourself. How did you get your start in this industry? Yeah, uh, so I started being interested in, I started building on top of Ethereum in 2016. I was always kind of like tangentially interested in crypto because I was uh, involved with a lot of the like P2P community in like the IRC days, um, but I ended up missing the boat on Bitcoin for some reason. I was just, I, I was personally just not very interested in it for some reason. Uh, and then uh, it wasn't until Ethereum came along and I, and I kind of discovered it in 2016 that it, it clicked for me that you could use this technology to build public goods, like truly public, uh, non-sovereign, non-corporate goods that are similar to the internet, that can be like globally accessible um, and can we, can be this like big equalizing force um, in, in, the, in the world economy. After that, so I, I started uh, playing around with the technology in 2016, um, built some infrastructure and worked with a couple of projects at the time. Um, I started the Ethereum, uh, SF Ethereum Developers Meetup, which was pretty awesome. Uh, because that was one of the first like communities uh, that was like actively building on top of on top of Ethereum, um, and then in 2017 uh, I ended up starting Connext because uh, I sort of had a lot of conviction on the techno on like Ethereum as a broader technology and on this decentralization movement, um, and my goal was just how can we bring this technology to a billion people as fast as possible. Cool. So before we actually dive into Connext. Um, you were also one of the summoners of the Moloch DAO, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so I helped design the Moloch DAO alongside Amin Soleimani um, and then helped build it with uh, my current co-founders, uh, Lane uh, Haber and Rahul Setharam, and then uh, one of the co-founders of Spank Chain at the time, uh, James Young, uh, along with Amin, uh, and, uh, and then 
the, I guess the idea at the time was um, we were really interested in solving this like coordination problem that that we we kind of felt that we had around uh, you know working collaborating with Spank Chain on on building scalability infrastructure. Um, and also was just like a broader coordination problem that we saw in the space and, and in the world more generally. Um, and the idea was that like, we wanted to create some sort of like public resource for uh, organizing a, like, like community action around public goods without necessarily having, like basically having that be a public resource itself. Um, and the, that idea kind of became the Moloch DAO, the first really, really the first like DAO framework that actually ended up getting traction um, uh, which was pretty awesome. I mean, we didn't, we didn't really like ever expect that to be the case. We were just kind of playing around with the ideas. Um, um, and the, the goal behind it was never like, here is a solution to coordination. It was like, here is a process by which like here is an initial step and then a process and a meme by which we can eventually hope to solve co coordination more generally. Um, uh, but the, the idea was always like, it won't necessarily happen. It might not even necessarily happen as a Malik DAO, but hopefully this can be the catalyst to start people thinking about this problem more more generally oh yeah i mean what it was definitely a right time right place moment and i mean basically the narrative behind it was uh, just compelling in 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 the light of the perceived weakness of the ethereum foundation and basically building uh things for for the community so yeah i uh, i think th this was uh it was uh, a great launch so tell us about connect so basically Connex actually started off as a state channels um, protocol, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, when we when we started Connex, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like the the key goal was always this technology, Ethereum uh, specifically, and and I guess like decentralized systems um, uh, has the capacity to really improve to to meaningfully rewrite the way that human beings coordinate at a global scale. Um, to move away from public infrastructure that is owned by governments or you know large scale infrastructure that is owned by like operated by corporations, um, and and towards making that infrastructure part of the commons, uh, globally accessible in the same way that the internet is globally accessible, um, and uh, and it comes from this like shared belief that the team had uh, or at least the founders had that like things like you know Google search things like uh, money things like. Uh, coordination tooling like voting and things like that are are should be accessible to everyone uh, in a, in a fair and egalitarian way regardless of where they live, um, which is not currently true for the majority of the world. And so the goal was always like let's take this this technology and let's find a way to scale it to the world. Um, and of course that pretty quickly led us to scalability research because that was like one of the biggest kind of blockers to being able to have many many uh, potentially a billion people people use this use uh, use Ethereum. In 2018, when we started looking at this uh, and it started doing like scalability research, uh, there there wasn't really a lot out there. Um, the the most of the research had been at that point been focused on state channels, um, and like Raiden was kind of like the the leading project on that at the time. Um, and then uh, there was new research that was being done about plasma. Um, we of course ended up jumping into state channels um, because uh, to us it seemed like the lowest hanging fruit use case was actually going to be payments. Um, and this is just a hypothesis that we came up with based on like what we saw in the space at the time, which was projects like Spank Chain and others who were doing, you know, some form of payments. And then uh, and then, of course, like, you know, plasma research continued over the course of the next few years. We, we kind of like expanded our understanding of state channels and things like that. Um, and we also moved towards like building, uh, you know, rollups as like a more generalized scalability solution, which has less scalability, but is like can be used for any kind of like arbitrary smart contracting. One thing that we found, and, and this is the reason that we ended up moving away from state channels, is just like a lot of our, our you know, we, we, we were largely an R&D org for a very long time. We, we like had a, a very, very small team that was very, very lean and very hungry and like uh, extremely careful about like the things that we built and about making sure that we only built the most minimal possible solutions. Um, one of the things that we consistently found, though, was that while there was a lot of interest in payments and around scaling payments as a market, there were actually very few use cases that scaled associated with payments more generally. Um, and in, and you can actually, if you look out at the space right now, you can actually, it's pretty easy to tell that like payments actually hasn't taken off. Crypto payments, surprisingly, despite the fact that many people have had a thesis about it for like almost a decade now, for some reason, uh, payments haven't actually achieved a lot of market penetration in the broader audience compared to things like DeFi and governance. And so we, we ended up realizing that like 
the solution that we were building, the technology that we were building and researching was not necessarily a technology that was mapping very well to the real needs of users. And, uh, and at the same time, what we realized, uh, this is actually very fortuitous, but in 2020, we, we, um, uh, there was the, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a, there was a, a, a bake-off that Reddit created. It was, it was like a scalability bake-off between like the different L2 solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I totally remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we actually, <laughs> this was actually the time when we were having this kind of like question, these questions around payments and around like payment related use cases. And one thing that we saw was like in this bake off, this was sort of like a quintessential example of like a decentralized ecosystem that wanted to build on top of a scalability solution. And what we found was like all like looking out at all of the other submissions that had been put in place, almost all of them operated like chains. Um, and we didn't. We had like we basically had to would have to would have had to go and build a very custom piece of infrastructure for Reddit specifically designed for their use case. And even then there would have been like gotchas and things like that that we had to worry about. Whereas, you know, which is nowhere near as like nice as just deploying the exact same contracts that you have onto Optimism or Arbitrum, right? Um, and, uh, and I think what that helped us realize was that maybe, maybe we were just on the wrong track, right? Like if, if, we, if we're trying to compete with rollups as a state channel network to try to scale something that is not payments, we're not going to succeed because we would have had to do a ton of custom work. But at the same time, the, the secondary problem that we saw uh, and this was actually just really, really lucky. We we just sort of said, okay, well, you know, there's all of these projects have this like big uh, drawback, which is, you know, once you're lock- once you're on one of these solutions, it's really difficult to get in and out of it. Uh, it's really hard to get between these different solutions. Why don't we just reappropriate our exact state channel infrastructure and use it to allow people to send community points, Reddit community points between these different options? Um, and that's what we did. We actually submitted uh, an alternative solution to the scalability bake-off we obviously didn't win because we didn't even we didn't even technically participate um but we actually did get a lot of attention both from the community and also from reddit uh where people looked at and and also from all the scalability solutions because people realized oh wait you can use state channels you use other kinds of technology to to allow for seamless bridging seamless communication between uh at the time it was like optimism arbitrum xdi polygon scale and a bunch of other test nets <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it was kind of cool that actually we, we, we sort of did it as a, like, let's not play a game that we know that we won't win thing. Uh, and you know, we, we kind of felt like we had to submit something, but we didn't really know what, uh, so we, we did this instead and it turned into us stumbling upon this really, really big, really, really interesting market that at the time, no one else had really even thought about. Yeah, I, I, I mean, let's talk about the history of interoperability and the hi- history of bridges in, in just a little bit. Um, just as an aside, why do you think payments has never really taken off? Because it seems like it's such a low hanging fruit, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think that's a, there's a lot of reasons. Um, the first, the first and main reason is that the payments market itself is just ex- incredibly complex, and there's like these really, really deep entrenched network effects um, associated with uh, the existing structure of like, like, like payment facilitating banks, uh, payment processors, Visa, Mastercard, and other like payment systems that makes it really, really difficult to break into this market in a, in like a, a functional way outside of outside of like places where that are just like completely unbanked. And I think I think that made it quite difficult at the time because like we just had a really hard time finding markets of users that actually cared about crypto payments. Um, you know, we we did, we ran a bunch of experiments in like gaming, we ran a bunch of experiments in content, we ran a bunch of experiments in like uh, countries where there were a large percentage of people unbanked and like we kept running into these like problems associated with like people being like, okay, well, you know, you're having to go through all of this additional friction to get crypto in the first place. What is the benefit of doing this versus like finding some other mechanism to pay? And like, why not just use mobile payments or why not just use like in-game payments and things like that? Um, so I think, I think the, the real reason is really just that like, it's the same reason why we can't just like fully replace all voting with crypto voting, right? It's, there, there's some of these, there's, there's some of these like really obvious use cases that people always talk about like, oh, well, Someone should just build a voting system on top of blockchains and then like we can just use that everywhere uh, as an alternative to existing voting and it gives transparency and things like that. And it would, but it would only work if like it's like not intrinsically a 10x improvement against what exists right now. And and because there are these entrenched network effects with what exists right now, I don't think that we'll be able to get to the point where it's like 
worthwhile to make that kind of upgrade for any user unless they already are onboarded into crypto. So, you know, I, I think for that reason, things like DeFi are a much better like initial onboarding mechanism because it's a 10x improvement against what exists currently because as a user, you're, you have access to like being able to earn a lot more money online than you would have ever been able to in the past, right? Um, like DeFi has onboarded large parts of Southeast Asia, uh, you know, Af- like Sub-Saharan Africa, L- Latin America, because in a lot of those places, like contributing to different ecosystems or participating in airdrops and things like that actually means life-changing money. Like that's that's a, an, an access that you would never have had before. Whereas participating in like getting on board into a payment system uh, or into a voting system isn't necessarily going to be as big of a change to you. Would you venture a guess uh, when we'll see the first large scale crypto based payment system? I mean, technically, the, it already exists, right? Technically, there are some mecha- some instances of like large scale crypto based payment systems. Uh, The Graph is a good example. Uh, like we worked really closely with them when we were doing state channel stuff because they're like, I think they're the single largest operator of like a micropayment network in the world right now, um, I believe. Uh, I mean, depends how you classify micropayments, but at least at the scale that they're doing it. And uh, and then similar to, you know, similarly like Saya, Filecoin and many others are also like working on building out their own bespoke, bespoke like state channel implementations if they haven't already. I think Saya already has one. And and so I think I think it exists. It's just like, It's just like been a much slower burn. Um, I would expect that this would happen for micropayments. It'll basically happen when the like Web3 infrastructure boom of like different kinds of Web3 protocols, computing networks and resource networks scales. Uh, it hasn't scaled yet, but it's starting to get there. Um, and then I would think for like consumer payments, it's not going to happen until like everybody has a crypto wallet. Yeah, I think that's a fair guess. So let's talk about the history of interoperability because basically that, that's that been one of those arenas of Web3 that have actually gathered um, a lot more traction than initially thought, right? So basically back in the day, kind of the idea of um, different blockchains uh, kind of talking to each other and having like trust as bridges and stuff, this seemed like magic. And I remember even even <laughs> hearing about um, you know Jay's IV, uh, IVC uh, vision back in the day. This seemed like I asked myself, is this actually feasible? I mean, obviously it is feasible, and it is clear to to us now. Um, but kind of let's let's talk about um, let's talk about the history. So basically, I mean, if 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 we kind of look back, the very first kind of bridges, so to say, we had were you know the the wrapped asset specific bridges right so things like wrap bitcoin and so on well technically the earliest ones were actually the atomic swaps so like you know btc ltc atomic swaps and things like that yeah fair point the asset specific ones do you remember them taking off kind of so like technically shapeshift took off um, and shapeshift is is in theory an atomic swap system atomic swap like system um, they do some other stuff, but you know, there that was like the idea behind it. Um, there were, of course, a lot of like proposals around using Lightning uh, and then extending Lightning to things like Stellar and uh, like Litecoin um, to do swaps there. Um, and then, and then once Ethereum came along, the idea of like, oh, you can have like I think Ethereum when Ethereum came along, that was like when there was a bit of a transformation because people started thinking about like instead of just okay, let's swap BTC for ETH which has a whole host of problems associated with things like, you know, front running and free riders um, or, or free options, sorry. Uh, the Instead, the the conversation turned to, okay, how can we have a representation of BTC on Ethereum that can then be used? Um, and that's, I think, par- par- part of when things got a lot more interesting as well. I think the earliest projects there were things like BTC Relay um, and uh, and a couple of others. Uh, and like, it's pretty interesting because like the things that have really taken off are, are, are like WBTC, which is of course like a fully custodial, uh, BTC bridge representation by Bitco. I think a part of the reason why a lot of these things didn't take off is because the need for them wasn't actually as strong at the time. You know, like the, the idea was always like, okay, well you can swap BTC for something else, like between these, like, you know, account, uh, like between these, like. UTXO style chains where 
uh, there isn't any like broader functionality, but the but that that functionality was always like fully encompassed inside of a centralized exchange anyway. And so if you were unless like th there was like the novelty of like, OK, I can do this in a trust minimized way. But the the fact that you could always use an exchange for it was also like just made it so that there, there wasn't like a huge improvement against that to begin with. Um, I think what's changed in recent times is that is the explosive growth of the Ethereum ecosystem and like how that has resulted in this like fragmentation across multiple Ethereum like chains. Um, and of course now moving to like non-Ethereum like chains like Solana and, and like Starkware and things like that as well. But um, largely it is all EVM compatible at the moment. I think the, the like that has instigated this like question of, okay, well, should common protocols, uh, especially like blue chip DeFi protocols, should they just be deployed everywhere? And I think most of them just said, yes, that should absolutely happen. And once you do that, now you have this problem where it's like, okay, you have different rates for these different protocols and different chains. Users now want to optimize the returns that they're getting. Users now want to use applications that run in many ecosystems all at once. And now you've created this like huge problem around where do users go? How do users actually do that? Um, the other piece of it is also, um, which I think is actually a little bit intu unintuitive, is, is that a lot of the conversation, at least like in the earliest days uh, of this big bridging growth that happened, which was really at like in like January and February of 2020, um, what we saw was that the vast majority of people that were bridging were not like Ethereum L1 users. Uh, surprisingly, uh, it was not people who were already using these chains. It was new users coming into crypto because, you know, there was just a massive growth of, of like end users at the time, it was new users that were onboarding, finding that Ethereum L1 was too expensive for them. And so they were onboarding directly into like BSC through Binance and then going to Polygon uh, or onboarding directly into Polygon and going to XDAI or something like that. And so what, what, what we found was like, and this is still the case actually, is like the Polygon BSC Gnosis chain combo is actually by far the most used set of chains that people bridge between. And, uh, and, you know, even a lot of the no node operators in our network are actually surprised by this because they're like, well, we would have, we would have thought that tons of people would be bridging in and out of Ethereum, but that actually doesn't appear to be the case at all. It seems like most of the people that have their funds on Ethereum are just like not touching them as much as they possibly can. Do you think that's just because every time you touch them, you incur horrendous gas fees or why do you think that is? I think that's a big part of it. And I think the other part of it is also that like one of the things that made Ethereum so interesting, interesting and exciting in the early days was just that it was like it was very experimental. And like so there was a lot of room for people to go and just build things and like try new things. And even if those things were not gas optimized or were really poorly built or had like problems, it didn't really matter that much. Right. People were just like playing around. Um, there is like a fun. There's just so much like it is so much fun for developers, uh, builders to be able to like play with things. And I think that element was lost when when prices, the price of everything on Ethereum escalated significantly. Um, and what we found was that a lot of the new developers that were coming in the ecosystem that wanted to do the same thing that early developers did on ETH L1, which was just play, have a good time, like play with building things. They all were doing this on Polygon and BSC, all of them. Um, and so what we found was like, it was really just like a lot of completely new people. Like we, most of the the support requests that we had in our ecosystem were actually associated with how do you speed up transactions in MetaMask, not anything related to like bridging itself. Yeah, super interesting. When you think about like the the different bridges that you can have, can we look at them kind of by um, the thing that they bridge, right? I mean, so basically there's there's uh, ERC twenty tokens. Uh, yeah, 721s, 1155s, um, there's message bridges. So how do you think about that just from, you know, a zoology kind of point of view? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the most general primitive is just like arbitrary message passing, right? It's like, how do I get some data from one chain to another chain? Ideally trustlessly, uh, which basically means ideally without introducing additional trust assumptions against those that exist on the underlying chains. Um, and of, of course, that is an extremely difficult thing to do. And like there are really very few if, or perhaps no constructions that fully achieve this. Um, but because that is like the base layer, you do sort of 
end up in a situation unless and and i, I want to carve out an exception here which is atomic swaps which are like a very special case scenario but for anything else the idea is like you sort of need to have this ability to like pass around data to begin with before you can do anything else now on top of that so that's that's kind of like the message passing layer now on top of that what you'll use usually have is like um you know other layers for other kinds of bridging so you know you could allow for uh, some wrapper around the arbitrary message passing that allows you to mint and burn NFTs and now that becomes an NFT bridge. You can allow doing the same thing with the RC20s and now that becomes like a token bridge. Um, and that, that specifically is a token bridge that allows you to like mint and burn wrapped representations of that token. And then, uh, and then the last piece that kind of like potentially sits on top of all of this is like the liquidity piece. So, uh, and this is, this is a big part of what Connects does. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like connects and and nomad which is the like arbitrary message passing network that we sit on top of um but um uh, you know the liquidity specifically re refers to how do you ensure that the user gets the correct asset on the ch like that they need uh on a given chain um especially given that in many cases that correct asset may be different than the minted representation that you create through an arbitrary message passing bridge and uh, and that is something that requires, you know, things like liquidity pools uh, in order to make sure that you bootstrap liquidity in the asset that you need to, like, transmit to the user. There's a lot to unpack here. So maybe just to rewind, just to, to make sure this is absolutely clear. So basically, when I um, take an asset, say, from... Uh, from Polygon to BSC um, via a specific bridge, um, that, that um, asset that is de facto minted at that point in time on um, BSC um, is um, basically is that asset uh, this uh, that asset underscore the bridge that it came over and it's not fungible with that asset that lives on that chain natively or came uh, by means of another bridge right exactly so the the problem here is basically like when you have an asset representation on on a given chain if it's the canonical asset um what makes first of all there's this bigger question of like what makes this asset the canonical asset generally what we say is like okay it's the most widely adopted asset it may be it may be like in polygon's case it may be the asset that's coming over the polygon pos bridge um in other cases it may just be the asset that happened to get the most traction so like on avalanche it's like usdce uh which is like the representation of usdc that everybody everybody just started using and now it's the canonical one the second piece there is a second question there is like who actually owns the authority the the permissions to create more of this canonical representation um so typically this will be like in polygon's case will be like the the like chain sponsored bridge right the polygon pos bridge um in avalanche it's the avalanche bridge um in rollups it'll be the rollup bridge and so it, the rollups actually have like an easier time with this because they already have a trust minimized bridge that is the canonical one and nobody can ever dispute that but uh, if you if you don't have one dedicated uh, bridge that is meant to, minting like a canonical token, you don't have necessarily a canonical token to begin with, things get a lot more confusing. So what happens if, for example, you have another bridge uh, like Nomad, for instance, that is like minting an asset on Polygon, the minted asset on like the Nomad will likely not have the permissions to increase the supply of the Polygon POS USDC representation. Uh, and so instead, what Nomad would do is they would have to create their own representation, which is a pointer to wherever those tokens were first locked um, on, on whatever chain. And, uh, and now you have an asset that is Nomad wrapped Polygon USDC, and then you have another asset that is Polygon POS USDC. And the Polygon POS USDC is the canonical one because it is used widely across all of the DeFi applications on Polygon. Um, and so as a user, you now have this like user experience problem of, I have this asset, how do I get to the correct asset? Because I can't actually use this asset anywhere. It sounds like a mess. It's, it's definitely a huge headache. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you go about it? Yeah. Um, so what we do is wherever possible, we try to swap the user into the, like, the canonical asset, the most widely used asset. Um, uh, and so this kind of gets into a little bit of the technical details of like how Nomad works and things like that and how Connects fits into it, which you can definitely get into in, in more depth. But um, at, a, at a high level with how Connects works currently, we just basically swap into liquidity pools of whatever asset is like the most widely used. And in the future, what we'll be doing is 
we would use, uh, so rather than swapping directly between chains, just as a mechanism to improve the usability of Connext and the, uh, the experience of running a node in Connext, um, we will mint a nomad representative asset uh, that goes across chains. Um, this will be like the, the sort of uh, default asset uh, that is used in our system, but then at, at the, the exit point when the user is about to receive their liquidity, that will be swapped for some local asset if needed um, using a stable swap. So uh, the construction here is a little bit similar to something like Hop, where uh, you know Hop basically utilizes the arbitrary messaging bridges on rollups to create H tokens, which are their own representation, and then they swap them at at the end into like the 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 rollups token if needed. How do you make sure you have sufficient liquidity um, when people try to move across uh, large sums of money, or even? tokens that you have, I mean, you need to onboard tokens, right? So you can't offer this for just any token. You kind of need to know which tokens are coming in advance. Yes. Um, yeah, that's definitely a challenge. Um, I think this is something that we're still trying to understand the best sort of user experience around uh, It's and developer experience around because it's, it's complicated and it seems to really change based on use case. Um, what we have right now is the ability to set like slippage tolerance in these transactions. So you can you can at least like be sure that as a user, you're not going to get completely wrecked by slippage because there wasn't enough liquidity. Um, and then in failure modes, what we do is we we just like um, allow the developer to basically like exit the user's funds onto exit funds onto like a given chain and then have the developer actually be responsible for figuring out how to handle the error case themselves. Um, and over the long term, the idea is like we're going to try to build a better taxonomy of use cases and and the way that those are handled from an error perspective uh, or from a like failure mode perspective and then find like default mechanisms to handle those failure modes but at this stage it's like early enough it's too early for us to really be able to say definitively that like every kind of use case of x type needs to be handled in this way because we just we just don't know yet yeah i mean the complexity behind kind of having all these different flavors of more or less the same asset. Um, this is actually really mind-boggling. Um, so, in a way, you kind of need someone who behind behind the scenes. I mean, it's kind of like having this this massive ball of yarn, right? And someone behind the scenes kind of needs to, you know, con you know, perpetually kind of order it and unwind it and make sure that kind of it doesn't tangle too badly. And it actually gets worse too. So, like on chains, you know, there's there's been like several waves of chain launches. Um, in, a, in a lot of the earlier chains like Polygon, BSC, Avalanche, uh, there were already like chain built canonical bridges, right? And like the, the chains themselves were like, you know, had a lead time to have those canonical bridges be kind of publicly used before other bridges came and started like building, creating their own like representative assets. But in a lot of the newer chains that have launched in this like second wave uh, of, of L1, uh, uh, like L1 releases have... Uh, things like Moonbeam and Evmos, things are a lot more messy. So like, for example, on Moonbeam and Evmos, Connects and Nomad are technically the, the default bridge. We're technically the official, officially supported bridge. But that that hasn't really meant anything because like there's these are permissionless systems. It's possible for a lot of other projects to come and deploy on these systems. And that's actually a good thing if they do. Um, but what that means is like now on Moonbeam, for instance, there are also like uh, multi-chain uh, like representative tokens. So any tokens, uh, there are seller representative tokens, there are synapse representative tokens, wormhole representative tokens. Uh, and, uh, and now it's an extremely confusing problem for the user. And there's no, there's no, you know, even if the Moonbeam team says, okay, XYZ tokens are the canonical representation, it ultimately isn't even really up to them. Like they, they it, it really is up to uh, the network effects of the applications that are running on top of this in, in this ecosystem. So uh, we have yet to figure out a good way to solve this mess. Um, there are definitely a lot of proposals out there to do things like allow multiple bridges to mint the same token, but then that just increases risk massively across the entire space. So we're, we're generally pushing back against things like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a very big, very hairy problem that at the moment doesn't really have a solution. I, I want to talk about security um, a little bit later, but kind of let's let's talk about this for for a little while longer. So I mean, basically, we've seen a, sim a similar version of this problem across DEXs, right? So basically, the arbitrage opportunities that you have between different DEXs. I mean, and the way that the market has solved that is by kind of um, 
having market makers who kind of, I mean, in, in a negative reading, they're arbitrageurs, but in a positive reading, kind of, they make the market more efficient because you can kind of trade across, because the, the price of, of different assets kind of normalizes across different DEXs, right? Do, do you think um, having such radically uh, decentralized approach to, to the bridge problem would be a good solution or do you think it has drawbacks? Yeah. So basically the question is like, is it a good idea to just offload the balancing between these different kind of bridge options and, and, uh, and moving basically moving between these different assets to just liquidity providers and market makers who can ensure that users will get the right asset. And like, as a result of that, we, we can still maintain like a good user experience uh, while having multiple bridges. I think so. I mean, I think that's regardless of whether or not it's a good solution, uh, which I, I think it is. I mean, I think it is in the sense that like it's there really is no other option. Um, uh, so I, I, I do think that like we are headed in that direction regardless, which is that like there will likely be a lot of stable swaps on all of these on all of these chains that will allow you to move between these different representative assets. And I, I think eventually long term all of these projects will eventually they just like plug directly into the stable swap so that the user is just getting the right asset on a given chain but i think i think that core problem of like how do you even determine what the right asset is 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 just at the moment just a huge mess uh it's just like an open field right now where like you know we and other bridges are actively like you know chains like moonbeam are are actively battlegrounds where we and other bridges are fighting for market share and trying to work towards uh, having our version be like the canonical representation. Um, and of course, like on our end, it's not the worst situation in the world if that doesn't happen because we can we can just allow for swapping into the right one. But at the same time, you know, if, if our whole model is we want to make sure that users are like our, a big part of what we care about is like a globally trust minimized option. Um, you know, we, we really feel strongly that like the inherent risks associated with bridging and with like cross-chain interoperability are much higher than even just like chains themselves. Uh, there are systemic problems associated with that. And a lot of the systemic problems are also arise from um, like potential economic failures, right? Not just, um, you know, the bridge gets hacked or there's an implementation bug or, or like, a, like a security vulnerability, but instead uh, there is economic risk where uh, markets uh, or like the the economics of bridges could be manipulated to attack them, um, and this is similar. This is basically what happened, you know, with Terra, for instance, where uh, you know markets, uh, Terra markets were manipulated to exploit a vulner economic vulnerability in the way in, in Terra's in Terra system in the USD system, and uh, and the idea is that like long term, if we want this ecosystem to be sustainable, we have to build systems that remain vul invulnerable to those kinds of attacks, you know, because those kinds of attacks will happen uh, either from, you know, uh, theoretically shady Wall Street organizations or perhaps governments or perhaps large scale corporations or billionaires that want to find ways to extract value. Um, and so my, my concern is like, I don't, you know, on the one hand, it would be it doesn't really matter that much if we end up in a world where like you know you're utilizing nomad to go across nomad and connects to go across chains and then at the at the at the exit we're swapping into like any usdc or something like that the but at the same time that of course means that users are now holding any usdc in their wallets and so now they are still subject always permanently subject to the risk of of any swap or multi chain yeah i i have um, so many questions about security and basically how security guarantees kind of transfer from, but I kind of, I want to save them because first I, I want to hear about, um, Nomad and Connects and basically who does what and how they interplay and how this partnership came about. So I can start with how the partnership came about. Um, so we, you know, we've been researchers in the space for a really long time. Uh, working with a lot of like key research teams that are out there. So, you know, we work super closely with like, and we have worked super closely with like, you know, the Optimism founders, the Arbitrum founders, the EKSync founders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that, I think a lot of people don't realize that that community is actually really small. So like, even though it seems like a lot of these projects are competitive with one another, we all like share notes. We all talk to each other constantly. Uh, we all present at the same conferences, research conferences, uh, because 
ultimately, you know, there is like, of course there is competition, but at the same time, like we sort of all recognize that the market for this is so massive that at this stage it's, it's like pretty positive sum. Uh, in for us, uh, you know, early on, uh, one of our key advisors around this interoperability piece was always James Presswich, uh, because he is just like one of the foremost people who has been thinking about bridging for many, many years longer than anyone else has at all in the space. Yeah, we had him on for summer, uh, probably like four years ago or so. And basically, he had just launched the, the, the Bitcoin Ethereum uh, auction bridge. Yeah, James is yeah. awesome. Um, Super cool. <laughs> and, uh, and he's been thinking about this like very, very deeply for quite a long time for a good reason. Um, and he has like pretty nuanced opinions on this stuff. It's not, you know, he, he understands that there are like very big trade offs and understands that there is like a uh, there is room for multiple different kinds of solutions out there. Um, um, and so I think a lot of a lot of the reason that we ended up working with Nomad was just because of our very deep relationship with James. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and as a, as a result of that, also like the, the very strong cultural similarities between the Connects team and the Nomad team, which is that like, we're all just very kind of, uh, we are all people that have been very, very uh, focused on like producing value in this space and around research and around like building these sustainable public goods that are actually trust minimized and actually trying to do something good. Um, and we are also all both like teams that care about the same kinds of things that like have the same kinds of attitudes towards like building communities and, and like being sustainable organizations. But then beyond that, I think, I think there's also just, there was just like a natural fit as well. So like we, um, uh, what we found was that over time, you know, Connext historically had been focused on atomic swaps, uh, because we were really interested in just solving the like liquidity piece first before expanding to other things. Um, now, of course, our, our, we really th do think that the holy grail is to be able to do any kind of arbitrary messaging and also have liquidity built in. And, uh, and that was something that we were struggling for a while because uh, struggling with for a while, because what we found was that there was just no really good way to do that um, out there. Uh, and this is this kind of gets into like the interoperability trilemma piece, which uh, which which I wrote, which which uh, which basically breaks down uh, the trade off space around bridges and, and shows that it's actually really difficult to have. Uh, any system that simultaneously is deployable to many different chains um, is uh, supports arbitrary message passing, so it's generalized and and then also is trust minimized. And as we were looking out into the space, what we found was like we wanted to find fi create some sort of either create or work with some sort of mechanism to do this. And the only mechanism that we found that actually had acceptable trade offs was Nomad. Uh, so we we were we became involved pretty early. Uh, you know, we were been were collaborating closely with the team for quite a long time. Um, and at this stage, the way that the relationship works is that like um, we sort of think of ourselves as as the shared stack. We actually call it the modular interoperability stack, um, uh, which is the this thesis that like it is impossible, similar to like uh, the scalability trilemma and uh, and modular blockchains as a solution to the scalability trilemma. Uh, there is because there is this interoperability trade off space. Uh, it is not possible for us to just have a single solution that solves everything associated with bridging uh, and interop. Instead, we need to find ways to split out the responsibilities and build a stack of protocols that can work with each other in a limited way uh, with, with kind of like fixed interfaces and delay, fixed delineation of responsibilities um, that can then provide a solution that actually is as close to ideal as possible. Uh, so... The way that the the delineation of responsibilities works is that Nomad provides this like base layer of message passing. Um, Nomad allows you to do generalized uh, communication between blockchains with very reasonable, fair, very trust minimized assumptions, uh, like security assumptions, and um, and then but with the trade off of needing thirty minutes to do to pass messages between trains. Um, and that thirty minutes is the amount of time needed to like instigate a dispute if if something if fraud occurs within Nomad. So, so that's because it's 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 inherently optimistic. That's why yep. you need the okay. So basically, exactly. So like Nomad in in Nomad's model, uh, the assumption is not like in something like IBC, where you know in IBC you have what is called a validity proof, where you have uh, one chain, like the the validators of one chain are like verifying the consensus of another chain, um, and they're doing this for every single message that. That goes between chains, but of course, the downside of validity proofs, and this is this is mirrored onto like CK rollups, for instance, is that you are for every single transaction or batch of transactions you're having to do this proof, and so the cost overhead of it is quite high. The complexity of it is quite high. The the, the like cryptographic 
and like, you know, consensus dependencies of this are quite high because you have to kind of figure this out for every single chain. Whereas on Nomad, in Nomad, it's the other the other end of the spectrum, similar to optimistic rollups, where you actually say, okay, well, we're not actually going to validate anything unless something actually goes wrong. Um, and so you don't validate, like you, you don't submit proofs uh, that any given state transition or any given update is valid. Instead, you just say, let's just assume it's valid and then wait 30 minutes or wait a certain amount of time for someone to say, oh, they have a problem with this. But but this kind of this is predicated on the assumption that there's enough people kind of watching this stuff, right? So basically, and this is something that I mean, if if you look at the past six months or so, with what what has gone wrong with bridges, I mean, I mean the Ronin bridge hack, no one even noticed for like five days, and I mean it's like, I mean, do we have um, enough analytics to be alerted to things? How many how many uh, how many uh, you call them watches, right? How many watches do you, do, do you have uh, on these kind of uh, uh, bridges? So right now, the watcher set in Nomad is permissioned. Um, the reason for this is just that it's like a, a stepping stone, a progressive decentralization process. Um, it's the same reason why like optimistic rollups, for instance, don't actually implement fraud proofs. So technically, they're sort of custodial, but like Obviously, people recognize that the model itself makes sense um, and recognize that it's a process to get there. What Nomad is actually working on right now is expanding that watcher set. Um, uh, so to move away from just like them running a bunch of watchers to to like allowing other people to run watchers, it'll still be permissioned at the moment, but it will be much larger. Um, and one of the key goals there is to move towards like, unlike with many other systems, um, in Nomad's case, there are already a bunch of actors that are watching the chain and looking for fraud. Uh, a good example of this is Connects nodes. So, like, um, uh, I guess like one one kind of piece that's missing here, perhaps, is context. Is like, if Nomad is providing this like messaging layer, Connects is providing the liquidity layer that sits on top of it. And what we do is we short circuit the thirty minute Nomad uh, latency in certain cases where it's safe to do so. And those cases are cases where our nodes are willing to front capital for transactions. Uh, they have the permission to execute the transaction on the receiving chain. So basically, like it's a it's an unpermission call. So like something like a Uniswap swap, rather than something like a token mint. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, uh, they do so only when they recognize that their fraud hasn't actually occurred, because they are the ones that are taking on the risk. Um, now, what's interesting there is that they are actually already performing the function of a watcher. All we have to do is add a little bit more code for them to to like start a dispute on chain. Um, but any all of the like resource overhead of them watching for fraud has already occurred. Um, and we have, I think, 131 uh, routers on our testnet for the next upgrade that includes Nomad. So that's already 131 watchers that could go live pretty much immediately, uh, which already, you know, if you assume, I think if you assume like a 10, like a 80% uptime uh, for watchers, I think the odds of all of the watchers being offline at the same time then becomes like in the 10 to minus 20 range or something like that. Uh, which is pretty awesome. That's slow. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a final point here, this actually there is a live system where this works and it's been shown to work. So like the Ronin bridge hack is a is a is a great counterexample of like why multi-sig bridges don't work and why you need to make sure that you have like this is like it was like the first example of like a, a root root of trust compromise uh, for for a bridge um, and shows like the the risk of of having like you know this like permission based bridging mechanism where you have keys that have the ability to arbitrarily mint funds on other chains versus a revocation based bridging mechanism like Nomad where you can dispute if if anyone can dispute if something occurred. Um, and But you're totally right that like it, it wasn't noticed. Um, and I think that that was definitely like a huge pit failure uh, in like the that ecosystems part that like there weren't better analytics around this. But a counter example is like the, the Rainbow Bridge hack that happened recently. Um, so uh, for, for context, the Rainbow Bridge is a bridge that exists between Near and Ethereum. It is a fully trust minimized bridge. Um, and the way that it works is that uh, in, in one direction, it is a fully native bridge similar to, to IBC, uh, where I think the Near ecosystem is running a like client of Ethereum. Um, and then in the other direction, it is an optimistic bridge. Um, and the optimistic direction was attacked. Uh, and the watchers of the uh, Rainbow Bridge ac actually successfully detected that an attack had, had occurred. Um, the attack wasn't even a, like fraud uh, from like the, the bridge updater, but was instead an, a hack of the contracts themselves. The watchers successfully detected the hack 
and paused the bridge. Uh, so basically stopped any sort of fallout as a result of, uh, of, uh, of like the hack occurring, unlike with Ronin or Wormhole or others. So how, um, how do you incentivize the watchers, right? Because basically if you don't incentivize them, basically they, they can just haul the chain and grief everyone without any cost to themselves, right? So in that way, you kind of, you would, you would actually end up um, trading security for liveness. Um, that is actually the main research question and optimizing that process is the main research question that remains to be able to make watchers permissionless. Um, the general idea is that uh, you can use a combination of things like token incentives uh, and then also like uh, bonds and, and slashing of those bonds to be able to ensure that, you know, updaters are penalized for fraud and then watchers are penalized for false reports of fraud. Um, and because the, the like, there's no real like material, like financial upside for, for a watcher to do this other than like the griefing vector of dosing um and so as long as the the downside risk for a watcher of hey i'm going to lose xyz amount of funds if i've like fraudulently you know stopped this bridge is as long as that's the case you can be reasonably certain that it doesn't really make a lot of sense for for like watchers to do that now there's 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 definitely a lot of like research that is currently in progress around this to figure out what are the bounds around that like how can we be sure that like the penalties for this are high enough for watchers to be uh, to be disincentivized from like, you know, dosing. Um, and then similarly, uh, how do you ensure that the, the rewards are high enough for watchers to be incentivized to actually like attempt transactions? And how do you make sure, for instance, that like, if there are rewards, uh, it is not possible to front run those re for like, you know, MEV bots to front run those rewards in the mempool, uh, which is, which happened in the near rainbow bridge case, which is quite interesting. Uh, so these are the kinds of questions that that I think like nomads researchers de are dealing with at the moment that uh, uh, are the the main blockers to being able to completely open the system up. Cool, yeah, super exciting. For what it's worth, by the way, these are also the same same research questions that exist in optimistic rollups around incentivizing watchers. <laughs> so basically, seeing that uh, Connex basically offers liquidity or liquidity underwriting on top of on top of the bridge um how do you deal with how do you think about reorgs and probabilistic finality right because basically if if something happens on the chain that you send something from and basically it reorgs then and you have already paid out the money on the other cha chain how, i mean is that kind of priced in or do you do you have uh, it, 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 can you somehow mitigate that danger this is a part of the risk of running routers in Connect. Um, and this is the this is the risk that we try to mitigate. Is like the the risk as a router, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I see that there is this slow slow 30 minute transaction that's coming over Nomad. I see that it is possible for me to complete this transaction faster, and I see that I have enough liquidity to do so and I can earn a small amount of fees by doing that. Um, and so we we sort of like mitigate the the latency trade off of Nomad. We also ensure that the user gets the right asset that they need, um, and we make sure that uh, and and like the only kind of the the I guess the the trade off or not not necessarily the trade off, but at least like the the decision matrix around doing that is then based on what is the risk to the router that is actually making this happen, um, and that that risk profile is based on you know how how likely is it that fraud has occurred in Nomad. Uh, what is the risk of some sort of like chain event, like a reorg or a fifty-one percent attack, and uh, what is the risk of like some sort of failure, like some sort of failure mode on the receiving chain that results in like me as a router not being paid out? In the reorg case, at the moment, what we just do is wait. <laughs> we just wait for enough blocks. Um, we've done a lot of like statistical analysis over the course of the last year and a half uh, to just like just because we've we've been live for that long to be able to understand how many blocks we need to wait on each chain. Um, and, uh, and generally what we found is like the reorg risk is really only biggest on, uh, like fast chains that are, have like very, very low fees, like BSC and Polygon, um, uh, where you can see like deep reorgs, uh, and on most other chains that isn't as much of a concern. So usually waiting about two minutes everywhere, it appears to work quite well. 
What we'd like to do is move towards a model where we actually don't need to wait for reorg risk, but that's quite difficult. So uh, some things that have been talked about in our community, for instance, are the possibility of building some sort of reorg insurance where you actually just like have users underwrite uh, the risk of uh, uh, the reorg risk of a router. And like because you can de detect like reorgs in on chain within a contract, you could actually uh, uh, deterministically pay out that insurance bond to a router if a reorg occurs. Uh, but the uh, again like the this is something that's been like talked about in theoretical terms but like the economics of it are something that we'd need to figure out like basically what is the likelihood of reorgs uh what is that scale of risk versus reward look like and what kind of fees would you need to charge as an insurance provider in order to to mitigate the the massive additional risk that you might have on some other chains yeah i mean as soon as as soon as uh ethereum and possibly a lot of other evm based chains uh, move to proof of stake uh, I mean, the real risk, uh, I mean, it doesn't fully go away, but it, it, it reduces greatly. Right. So reduces. Yeah. And we've been working with like, we've been working closely with the Polygon team, for instance, on, on, on this problem to try to talk to them about like, what are ways to think about this? I know that this is like a huge priority for them as well, that like they are trying to work on improving their own consensus mechanisms and the way that like nodes operate in their network to be able to reduce the rate and depth of reorgs as much as possible. But yeah, it's it's definitely it is definitely a problem right now with problemistic finality and and the the solution to the problem is just for us to wait longer um for routers to wait longer long enough that they are comfortable. Cool. So how how do you guys think about capital efficiency? So basically if you if you move um if if you kind of liquidity underwriter this kind of entails having capital at hand to kind of pay people out. So how do you think about not having too much um, on any one stockpile? Capital efficiency is a really interesting question and problem. Um, like the ideal sort of scenario, which is what we had originally tried to optimize for, was like you have a certain amount of uh, liquidity available on each chain and then you're just like utilizing that pool of liquidity to do transactions and there's no additional liquidity that's required and there's no lockups of liquidity that's required. Um, and so our, our existing system, uh, you know, the, the kind of V1 of our interoperability network uh, does this thing where like you, you know, you send transactions to a router and through an atomic swap, it, the router receives funds on one chain and then they give you funds on another chain. And in theory, this is the most like capital efficient option. But what's interesting is that uh, there's a capital efficiency and then there's capital utilization. Um, and what's interesting is that like the utilization is actually not that great, even though even if the efficiency is great. And the reason for this is that while the liquidity you know say say you're transacting like currently there's a lot of people that are you know uh, transacting getting out of ftm and going to other chains so say you're going from ftm to polygon while the uh the uh the liquidity that a user sends on ftm is immediately usable uh by the router to send a transaction in the opposite direction what we found is that in many in most cases the the movement of funds between chains and the the patterns by which people tend to rotate between chains are unidirectional um, uh, week to week. So, you know, the chain may change, but like everybody will flood to a given chain or flood away from a given chain at, in a given week. And, uh, and the difficulty with this is that now you end up, at least with what exists currently, you end up with like liquidity actually just piling up in a given, on a given, in a given place. So like, for instance, uh, you know, tons of liquidity piles up on FTM because everybody's trying to exit that chain. And in order to fix that, in order to make sure that that capital, you know, while that capital is, usable by someone who's going into FTM because the demand for going into FTM is low, we want to, we ne then need to have this like secondary problem of how do we get liquidity off of FTM and to somewhere else where it's more likely to be used. Um, and so utilization of that capital ends up being quite low. Uh, what we ultimately came to the conclusion of was like, it's actually better for, instead of, you know, it's better for us to actually take a hit with capital efficiency if we can increase utilization. Um, and, uh, and what we decided was to move towards this model where, uh, routers in our network send and receive capital on the same network. Uh, so they send and receive capital on the same chain so that they don't have to deal with this process of rebalancing. And, uh, and the, the process of running a router becomes like as passive, as passive as possible. They can, they can just like sort of turn it on, put it, put liquidity in, and then just like let it happen. Um, and this results in the best utilization because routers don't have to think about, you, you don't have liquidity piling up on chains that are not being used. And uh, the trade-off here is that now there is a capital efficiency problem. So, uh, or, or not really a problem, but you have a slightly reduced capital efficiency. So now what happens in our network is like, 
you have this the the base layer of this whole process is is the transaction that happens across chains with Nomad, um, where you burn a Nomad representative asset on one chain and then mint another Nomad representative asset on another chain. But uh, in order to make that process happen faster, uh, the router needs to you know and basically like avoid the thirty minutes of waiting for the user. The router now needs to take on that thirty minute lockup. So the router now has their capital efficiency reduced because they are their their capital is is locked up for 30 minutes every time they use it. And then sec- and then in addition to that, you now also need user provided kind of passively provided liquidity on each chain in a stable swap that that uh where if needed you are swapping from the nomad representative asset to the canonical asset on that chain. That said, I think because of the new mechanism, we actually will end up with much better uh capital availability and utilization and also probably much better pricing and the reason for this is just that um the price curve for like basically the incentive to rebalance the system uh in this case what rebalancing means is basically swapping assets back into nomad flavored assets and sending them in the opposite direction to another chain uh to basically generate more nomad liquidity there uh the incentive to do that is now concentrated in uh, the stable swaps on each chain. So the pricing is concentrated, which means that you have the best possible pricing, the least amount of slippage, uh, versus having you know each router have their own pricing curve and things like that. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, while there is a lockup of funds, um, that lockup is actually relatively small compared to the amount of the possible utilization of those funds and the frequency with which you could rebalance it in the past. So for example, say, you know, pessimistically, say like the Nomad lockup takes a full hour in case we decide to do batching or things like that, which we're not at the moment, but say we do that in the future. Even if you do, even if it takes a full hour, if the network has, uh, say the network has $100 million of liquidity, or currently we have about, you know, uh, $40 million of liquidity. So say the network has $40 million of liquidity, uh, that is that is locked up for a maximum of one hour uh, every time it it is used, utilized. That means with forty million dollars of liquidity, you can do over a billion dollars of daily volume. Uh, so that's far more capital efficient than many other things in the space. Anyway, so at that point, we're like, okay, this this is this makes sense from a from a efficiency and utilization perspective. What what's the fee you take in terms of basis points? Yeah, there's um. So there's several different kinds of fees in the network. Um, uh, there is a fee that routers take for the lockup of liquidity, and that is five basis points. Um, over time, that may reduce or increase depending on like the network dynamics and things of that. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but we have found that five basis points is like usually about 10x cheaper than most other options out there. Um, and uh, and in, even if it isn't, it is definitely significantly cheaper. Uh, it is definitely the cheapest option by far out there at the moment. Uh, and then in addition to that, there are two other kinds of fees. So there is, uh, there are the LP fees for the stable swaps, uh, and we don't quite know exactly what those will be yet, but that will be like a small fee that is paid, uh, that out to the, the passive LPs of the stable swap. And then in addition to that, of course, like the slippage in that stable swap, uh, generally we expect these to be fairly tight because these are all using, you know, stable swap AMMs. They're highly optimized for this. Um, and, uh, and generally speaking, this is passive liquidity. So we expect that users, it's like much easier, easier for us to bootstrap liquidity when users are able to passively LP. The last kind of fee is gas fees. So, uh, users need to pay the gas of the transactions that they do on both the sending and receiving chains. Um, they pay this, all of this in the sending chain asset, uh, sending chain, like native asset. Um, and the, the, the idea behind this is that like, we realized in the past we we have users pay gas fees from you know the transacted assets so like USDC for instance if it's going across chains what we realized is that like if we end up having long tail assets uh, it may not be the case that you know relayers and other other like service providers are are willing to accept fees in XYZ long tail asset shitcoin that doesn't even have like a market price <laughs> and so what we decided was that the the most acceptable form of asset that we can be sure the users will have and that relayers and other service providers will be willing to accept will always be the sending chain native asset. Uh, and the user experience of this is kind of nice as well because and developer experience is kind of nice as well because all users are doing is that they're just paying some additional gas fees on top of the gas fees that they would already be paying to do a transaction on that chain. Uh, and similarly, similarly as a developer, you are just, you know, 
making sure that the user pays this additional fee and then monitoring and bumping that fee if, if needed, uh, you know, if, if you need the transaction to go through faster or something like that on the receiving chain. But I mean, that sounds like really good business model, though. So, I mean, basically, if you I mean, I'm talking about the five basis points for uh, the liquidity provision for the half hour. Right. So basically, if, if you kind of um, if you had like perfect capital utilization and uh, you, you um, uh, that meant you could kind of have a billion dollars of uh, uh, volume a day um, and basically you, you got your uh, your risk management right so that basically you wouldn't be paying a lot for that that that's like five basis points on a billion dollars is like a half a million a day right uh yeah there's a it's it is a really lucrative model um and it is extremely low risk so this is a way for people to run infrastructure and get an extremely low risk like Potentially, I mean, of course, it's demand driven. And I think like the demand of the network ultimately is going to be what the results in returns for the router operators. And basically the ratio of the demand in the network to like the amount of liquidity provided um, by router operators. But at the same time, like in a de demand driven scenario, like you can easily get like 50 plus percent on any asset that you're providing liquidity on APR, APR, APY, sorry. That's crazy. Actually, it would be APR. So it's actually even more APY. <laughs> wow. Um so let, let's talk about, we're, we're, we're kind of over time already, but there's one thing I really want to cover. So let's talk about um, the user experience. So, I mean, ultimately what you want is the user shouldn't have to know which chain they're on. So, um, I mean, so basically if I want, I, I should go to a DAP and it should just work. And um, I mean, especially with um, the DeFi primitives, we've kind of seen in the past. How is composability um, of those DeFi primitives, or other primitives, to be honest, um, and bridges, how is that going to come together? Because it seems like two difficult problems. Is this a tractable problem? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think what we're experiencing right now is like the, like basically what we need to go through is this transition from, application uh, like decentralized application development going from being like a something that you do in like the synchronous model where everything runs on a single chain and uh, and like you can be sure that like you have results within the same block uh, for anything that you build versus moving to an asynchronous model that is more similar to how web applications are built more broadly um, and uh, and I think the difficult part will be figuring out how to make that transition happen with whilst uh, making sure that the developer experience and user experience remains as similar to what exists as possible. Um, I definitely think that like, I definitely I, like our, our thesis has always been that most users and users especially are not going to really care at all about what chain they're on. They're, they don't want to. And like, really, they're just going to want to use an application. And so if, if you if you're operating under those assumptions, then um, it should just be possible. It, you should move towards a world where if you're building an application, that application should be able to like accept transactions from any chain and should be able to potentially even have like liquidity pools on multiple chains that are connected to each other. Uh, I think that's possible, but it, it will involve like a transition that we are trying to make happen right now, which is that um, developers are going to have to move to a mental model where they are not necessarily re receiving the results from a given transaction immediately. They're instead having to do what you currently do when like building an application with JavaScript, for instance, where you make an asynchronous transaction or asynchronous call to another function that's just a, another process of living somewhere else on the internet. And you don't know when you're going to get a response. You don't know if you're going to get a response. And so now you need to have handlers for this. You need to have an error handler that handles what happens if you, you don't get a response, or you get an error. Uh, and then you also need to have a callback uh, uh, that, uh, or at least a callback handler that, that basically um, is executed when the return data comes back from another chain, which may be at some, may, you know, uh, given Nomad latency be like 30 minutes or so in the future. But yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think like, it's going to be quite interesting to see how this stuff plays out. Generally, from our perspective, what we've seen is that like uh, most, if not all, user-facing interactions can be short-circuited by Connext. Um, and so those can happen in under two minutes. And so what that means is like if you're a user that's like trying to use Uniswap on another chain or you're trying to just like get the best, say, for example, you are using Paraswap and you want to get the best rate across all chains, um, uh, Paraswap can actually 
it's like create transactions that go through Connext that aggregate all of their liquidity on multiple chains altogether. And that can happen in two minutes because the, the, you know, the, the DEX calls on each chain are unpermissioned. Um, and given that that's the case, like we expect generally that that's going to be an acceptable user experience for, for, for most users who are used to like using web applications and dealing with that kind of latency. And, uh, and we think there are ways to kind of like house that latency, like at least the latency increase from being like zero seconds to two minutes, uh, in a way that makes sense for users. You can show them like transparency. You can show them like connect scan or network explorer to show like track the transaction lifecycle. Um, and if something goes wrong, you could surface that really accurately. Cool. So Arjun, tell us what's, what's next for connect. So what, 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 what do you plan to get done, um, within the next year or so? Yeah. Um, the two biggest theme, things the team are, is focusing on right now are the the launch of the Amark upgrade, which is the upgrade that incorporates Nomad and moves towards this like generalized messaging pattern. Um, we already have that upgrade on testnet, or I guess there's three big things that we're focusing on. So we already have this upgrade on testnet. Um, there are a lot of people already building against it. I think uh, we announced the testnet publicly last week. And uh, since then, we've already had 131 routers set up on the testnet and then about 15,000 transactions, which is incredible. Uh, it's mind blowing that so many people have been interested in building on it and experimenting with it. Um, so we're, we're super excited about getting that live as fast as possible. And we, we, uh, we have audits scheduled to begin, uh, starting in about, I think about a week now. Um, so it should be like first, like second week of, uh, of June and then running until like the start of July. Um, and, uh, we should go live shortly after. The other two main pieces, uh, so that's that's a big part of the focus of like the engineering team and and, uh, and protocol team at the moment. And then the other two big pieces are uh, we have a contributor program that is ongoing. Uh, this is a way for people to start getting involved with working with the Connects ecosystem. And uh, and a big part of is that of this is that we want to take existing processes around you know running the router ecosystem and like growing it, uh, running the community and growing it, and and things like that, um, and and spin them out to the community entirely. Um, uh, the, you know, like uh, we want it to be the case that like our community is self-operating. We want it to be the case that like, um, you know, uh, routers are self-organizing to, to apply for grants. They are working in internally to improve the experience of operating in a router and like onboarding new routers um, and uh, versus the core team doing everything. Um, and, uh, and so that has already kicked off. Uh, there are, there is absolutely room for people to participate. So if you are a person outside of the US and you are interested in working with Connext um, or at least just interested in participating and being involved, um, you can sign up at contribute.connects.network um, and uh, and earn tokens to to uh, to basically work on helping us build this ecosystem. And then lastly, uh, the last main main focus is of course our token launch. So we announced about a month ago that we are we are heading towards uh, releasing the next token, which is going to be a governance uh, and staking token in our network. Um, there are also other kind of token mechanisms that we've been experimenting with and thinking about, um, but we we want to be like very conservative with the way that we implement them because it's it's really hard to take back a token model once you've implemented it if that token model is incorrect um and uh, and we really want to make sure that there's a lot of like community input um uh, once the DAO goes live on it but uh we're, we're currently expecting that to go live within the next like uh month or so uh we're, we're currently working on like finalizing uh, things like airdrop allocations, finalizing things like uh, you know the the fi like the la remaining legal pieces and things like that, uh, and like the the rollout of the token itself and how it will be distributed, um, uh, and of course given market conditions and things like that, it's, it's, we're we're thinking really carefully about how like making sure that we uh, that you know community members are like treated fairly and that uh, that you know people are getting materially. Uh, rewarded for their work or materially uh, like compensated for for the things that they do in the ecosystem both now and after the DAO goes live uh, as much as possible given that you know the the market you know may end up we may end up heading towards a bear market or things like that in the future. Cool, Arjun. S sounds like um, exciting times. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to see. None of us are sleeping. <laughs> what comes out of Connect over the next couple of months? Yeah. And it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.